Okay, uh, we can get started. So uh, today is the sort of second half lecture, second lecture on doing recovery. So last class we talked about doing logging. Again, this is where you're writing all the changes that transactions make into the database as it goes along. And now today we're going to talk about doing checkpoints. So how do you take a snapshot of the database and, um, and recover from that and then replay the log. So for today I'm going to talk about um, some quick course announcements related to project two real quickly in the beginning. And then we're going to focus most of our time on doing in-memory checkpoints. Uh, and then we'll finish up talking about how to do uh, this little trick from the Facebook guys on how to do fast uh, restarts of the database process using shared memory. So for um, project number two, the auto lab should be now online. The thing we were battling with was trying to get more cores to make the, the, the multi-threading stuff be more interesting and more thorough in the testing. So you should be able to submit and there'll be additional tests, again, that we're not providing you uh, in the repository that will run to make sure that your thing is correct. So because we were late on the auto lab, I wanted to have it done this weekend, but we had these problems. So I'm now going to give everyone a week extension. So the project will be due on March 9th. So it'll be not this Thursday, but next week's Thursday. Okay? Um, then, but everything else is still going to still, still be the same. So for your project three proposal, that will still be on the 21st which is the Tuesday from when you guys come back after uh, spring break. On next, at the end of next week, I will spend time at the end of one lecture to discuss, here's some project three topics that you could work on, and then you guys need to get together over spring break and figure out what you actually want to do and come give a, you know, a meaningful proposal on the 21st. And by meaningful, I mean not just like, hey, we think we're going to do this, wouldn't it be great, but actually has spending time to look at the code and understand what it's going to take to do the thing that, you, that you're proposing to do. Okay? So again, project two will be due next week. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll update the, uh, the course website with the, with the appropriate deadline. Any questions about this or project two? There's some questions on, on Piazza we'll take care of this week. Um, and anything else? In the back. Can you talk about the use of malloc? The question is, can we talk about the use of malloc? Can we use oh yeah, so um, yeah, thank you. I, sh I should have brought this up. Um, we prohibit you from writing malloc anywhere in the code, uh, and then there is the uh, there's a source code validator that makes sure that any invocation of malloc is only allowed in sort of whitelisted files. So uh, what we need to do is provide you with a better memory pool that doesn't have the spin lock in it. So if you just make a if you take the ephemeral memory pool, get rid of the the spin latch in it, the spin lock then you can use that in, in, in instead. So we need to go, we'll, we'll, you know, you can either make one and update the source code validator to whitelist your new file, or we'll have Dana make one today and send it out. So we only let you call malloc in certain places, so we'll provide you a file that you can then use and we'll whitelist it on the source code validator so you can call malloc there. Right, the idea is again, we, just don't, we don't want anybody calling malloc anywhere in, in memory database because that could be bad, so we only allow certain files to do it. Okay? And if there's anything else you maybe need, like a, um, I don't think you guys are going to need memset, but if there's anything else that's blacklisted, uh, talk to me. We can talk about how to add, add your file into the whitelist. Decide whether you, you actually do need to do the instruction you're trying to do. Okay? All right, cool. All right, so um, as I said, so the, the, the lecture we had last week uh, about the logging protocols these were uh, these sort of the standard mechanisms we're going to have inside our database system to make sure that we can recover the database after a crash or restart. Right? Because we're an in-memory database, again, if you, if you kill the process, everything goes away. So we're going to use the log to make sure that uh, all our changes that transactions make, that we then notify the outside world that a transaction has committed, are durable after, after a restart. But the problem with the logging protocol is that uh, it grows uh, indefinitely, it grows into infinity. So that means that when we restart the system, we're going to have to replay the log from the very beginning to put us back to the correct database state where we were right before the, the, the system stopped. Right? And depending on whether you're using a logical scheme or a physical scheme, this could take a long time. So in the case of the logical scheme, remember I said that uh, we were logging the actual SQL queries that we had to execute. So if you have like a 100 day log file, uh, it's going to take you maybe 100 days to, to restore the database after a crash because you have to replay all those SQL statements. I mean, obviously you can go faster than you did when they, when they were originally submitted, 
But if you're running at max capacity, your max throughput, then you know, if it takes you 100 days to run on the first time, it's take 100 days to run on the second time. There's nothing about recovery that makes this go faster. So to avoid this problem of having to replay the entire log, database systems take checkpoints. And the idea is that we're going to take a, we want to checkpoint, our checkpoint to be a, a snapshot of the database at some point in time where we know if we load the database upon restart at that checkpoint, then we can ignore anything that comes before it in the log. So essentially when you take, the, take a checkpoint, depending on what kind of scheme you use, there'll be a little entry in the log file that says, I took a checkpoint at this time. And it you know, usually says, Here, you know, here's the file location wh where it is. So again, you can, based on this, depending on what kind of checkpoint you can take, or depending on what kind of checkpoint you take, you can ignore any transaction that was executed prior to that because you, you know their changes, for the most part, will be included in that checkpoint data. So this is allows us to significantly reduce the recovery time of the database because we don't have to replay the entire log. We just, we just suck in the, the, the last checkpoint and then replay the log for everything that came after the checkpoint. So that's, that's the main problem we're trying to solve here. So now with in-memory checkpoints, they're going to be slightly different than how we would do a disk-based checkpoint. I mean, at a high level, semantically, it is essentially the same thing. Right? If you think of a disk-based database system, the checkpoint is basically taking all the dirty pages you have in your buffer pool and then writing out route to disk. In an in-memory database system, you're basically taking all the, the, all the pages of the database that are in memory and writing them out the disk, regardless of whether they're uh, dirty or not. Um, you can try to do delta checkpoints where you only write out the dirty changes. Uh, typically, people don't do that because then you have to go back through all the different checkpoints to find all the pages you're missing from the, the last one in order to restore the database. So typically, people, when people do these checkpoints, they just take the whole thing and write it out. So what we'll see as we go along, or I'll talk a little bit as, as we, we talk about different approaches, is that the kind of, the way you're going to do your checkpoints is going to be tightly coupled with the underlying concurrent control mechanism of the database system. I think for the papers that you guys, the paper you guys read for today, it was talking about doing checkpoints in the context of a sort of, of the H-store or VoltDB style system. But it, if you're using MVCC, for example, then you may want to use, do, do a different type of checkpoints, as we'll, as we'll see in a second. So essentially what's going to happen is when we take a checkpoint, there's going to be some some thread, background thread, and it can be one or, one or many, it doesn't matter, uh, depending how fast you want your checkpoint to, be, to go. And it's essentially going to scan the entire contents of, of the database at each table, going block by block, and writing them out to disk. And depending on how your data is organized in memory, you may, do transform, you may transform the data from an in-memory representation to a disk-based representation, or you can literally just take the bytes and write them out to, to, to the file in the, in the original form. Um, there's different trade-offs to doing each of these. Sometimes, um, you know, it's obviously faster to do the write-out if you just leave it in its original form, but how you lay things out in memory may not be the most optimal way to wait, lay things out on disk. So different database systems do, do different things. Okay, so the, the paper you guys read talks a little bit about what are some of the ideal properties you want to have in a checkpoint. And this actually list also comes to you from a, from a paper that came out last year from the guys at Yale on, on doing a sort of different types of checkpoints. But the high-level ideas are the same. So we can talk a little bit about what do we want, what are the ideal characteristics or properties we would want in our in-memory checkpoint uh, method or mechanism. And so they're sort of obvious in some ways, but we can talk about as we go along you know, the ramifications of the different approaches in the context of these desirable properties. So the first thing is obviously we don't want the system to slow down the regular transaction processing workload right, in our OLTB database while we're taking a checkpoint. Right, that would be bad if, if we say, hey, invoke a checkpoint, and then all of a sudden the, the throughput of the system drops by 50%. Right? No, that would discourage people from taking checkpoints, uh, and then that would make recovery take longer, and it's just sort of mess for everyone. The other things that are related to this, because latency is, is tightly coupled with, with throughput, is that we don't want to introduce any large spikes in the latency all of a sudden when either a checkpoint starts or it finishes. Right? And this can occur if you have to block all your transactional threads, or trans, or, you know, transaction working threads, from running anything while we you know, do the different parts of our checking protocol. And the last one, which is not essentially covered by the, the protocols we'll talk about in the paper you guys read, because um, they actually have a large memory overhead. Uh, but ideally, you don't want to have the database system have to use a ton of more memory uh, just to take a checkpoint. Okay? 
So these are the things that we ideally want. For these first two, we'll get them in the protocols we talked about. This last one depends on you know, which approach you're using. And also it actually depends on what the concurrent trial scheme you're using as well. So for, the, for all the schemes you guys read in, in the paper, and all the schemes we'll talk about today, these are all taking what are called consistent checkpoints. So a consistent checkpoint, if you sort of think of it in the context of snapshot isolation, it's then when you write out the contents of the database to disk in your checkpoint, you know that it's a consistent snapshot of, of the database at a single point in time. Meaning in your checkpoint, you will not see any changes or modified tuples that were, that were, that were modified by transactions that hadn't finished yet when the checkpoint started. Right, again, think, remember, snapshot isolation was when I started running my, my transaction, I, I would see a consistent view of the database where there would not be any changes from any uncommitted transactions that did not finish before my, my snapshot or my timestamp started. So the same thing applies here. So the advantage of this is that uh, when, when the database system comes back and we want to reload our checkpoint to, to load the database back into to memory, we don't have to do any additional processing because we know that there could not be anything that we should not see in our checkpoint. Right? There won't be any transactions that modify some tuples, they're in our, our checkpoint, we load that back in, and then we have to figure out whether they should actually finish or not. Because remember I said in an in-memory database, we're not actually recording any undo information. Right? So we're going to have no way, unless we, have, you know, unless we record the undo information, we can't have any uh, uncommitted transaction changes in our checkpoints. So this is why consistent checkpoints will be useful for in-memory database. We don't have to look anywhere else. Every, we come back and everything is okay. We still have to replay the log because we have to make sure we get all the changes that are made by transactions that came after our checkpoint, but they won't be in, in our snapshot. Now contrast this with fuzzy checkpoints, which is the more common approach used in a disk-based database system. In a fuzzy checkpoint, you don't prevent transactions from modifying the, the database while you're taking the checkpoint. And therefore, when you recover, you have to go back and figure out whether, what things you need to reverse. Remember I talked about Aries, we do the sort of the analysis phase to figure out what was going on in, 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 the, in the database system when we started, um, or right before the crash. Then we do the redo to make sure all our changes are applied. And then we have to go back and do undo to reverse things that shouldn't be there. And that's sort of what you have to do when you have fuzzy checkpoints. Right, so in a consistent checkpoint, the, the database system can say, I'm going to start taking a snapshot and write a single log entry that says, here's the point in time where my checkpoint started. And you actually don't need to record anything after that. Right? You maybe want to record that the, the checkpoint was succeeded, but there's no additional metadata to say, like, from when I started, from when I finished, here's the transactions that ran. But in a fuzzy checkpoint, you do have to do this. You have to know, like, what are the transactions that were there when I started? What were the transactions that were, that were there when I finished? And what were the pages that were modified in between them? Right, because then we're going to use this when we start when, when we come back online to figure out what should actually you know what what are the correct what should be the correct state of our checkpoint. So again, for, for this class for in-memory databases, we're going to focus on consistent checkpoints because this has the property that we want that we can come back we we can come back online uh, and immediately load in the checkpoint without worrying about correcting it. Another big question that also comes up is how often should you take checkpoints? So the papers don't really discuss this, but this is actually a big deal in, in practice in real systems, right? Because if you take a checkpoint all the time, just like nonstop, it could slow you down. In the silo R case of the paper you read last class, they were just continuously taking checkpoints. Uh, and then when a checkpoint finished, they waited 10 seconds and started all over again. Um, and they think they showed that they had um, you know, minimum slowdown in, in the system versus when you didn't have any checkpoints or logging at all. But I think if I remember correctly from the experiments, they were still not allowing the, ch the threads they were using for checkpoints to be, to be used for processing transactions. So in the case of the silo or, or system, although they were, had low overhead in taking checkpoints, in a real system, you, would, you, know, you can't use those threads to process transactions because they're processing checkpoints. So that slows you down in, in that way. Uh, there's other issues too. Now if like, you're spending all your time flushing buffers, to make sure you, you get all your, your, your checkpoint changes out to the file. There's a lot, lot of, you know, a lot of stuff going on that will slow down the regular transaction processing workload if you take checkpoints all the time. But if you take checkpoints too infrequently, then depending on what logging scheme you use, it may make recovery take a long time. Right? If you wait every you know, two days to take a checkpoint, then you're going to have this huge log that you then need to replay, whether it's logical logging or physical logging, 
then it may take longer for you do, to do recovery. Again, remember I said last class, one way to get around this is to avoid ever, you know, you still want to take checkpoints, but to avoid ever having to replay the log for a long time would be just to have these replicas so that if the master fails, you can, you can have the, promote the secondary, the replica, to become the new master. And that helps if one node goes down, but that doesn't help if your whole data center goes down. So we're still going to want to do our checkpoints, we still want to do our logins. So how often different database systems do checkpoints varies widely. Uh, so like in VoltDB, it's typically done on a sort of time basis. So you can say, I want to take a checkpoint every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every, every one minute. You know, really, you really cared about having high availability. Uh, in other systems that use physical logging, like MemSQL, for example, uh, and MySQL, the way they determine when to take a checkpoint, you set a threshold in, in your configuration file that says, when my log has written this much data, go ahead and take a checkpoint. So like in MemSQL, for example, when the log, the last log, entry, the, the amount of data written into your log since the last checkpoint goes to be like a quarter of a gig, then they fl flush out and do a, do a checkpoint. And again, if, if, depending on how often you do this, if you let the log get too big, then it makes your recovery time take longer. It just makes everything harder. So how to tune this exactly is sort of a black art. Uh, and usually the defaults in database systems aren't, aren't tuned to your application and you can get better performance if you know the right configuration. But that's a whole other you know, ball of wax, which you pay DBAs to figure out for you. All right, so for this, for everything we're talking about here, we're gonna ignore how often we take checkpoints. Uh, but just know that this is something you can vary depending on how, what, what your availability of requirement needs to be. All right, so now the paper you guys read was about doing in-memory checkpoints and they talked about four different approaches. to so naive snapshots, copy on update snapshots, and then wait free zigzag and wait free ping pong. So sort of as a spoiler, what I'll say is that I don't think anybody actually implements these two guys, um, the last two, but I think they're interesting to talk about because they, they show the trade-offs you can make for the different primitives you use to build up a checkpointing protocol. The, the second one is probably the, the, the most common one and we'll see ways to do this. Um, so another thing about the paper, uh, they sort of use terminology that doesn't really fit in with all the other papers we've talked about so far in the course, as well as the things we'll talk about in the future. Right? They talk about these sort of um, these you know these applications where you, they had this application state in memory, and you need to checkpoint that all the time. You can sort of essentially think of that as like the working state of an application. So the idea is that instead of having you know if your your entire database is 100 gigs, but you only have a uh, you know one gigabyte of the database is only being updated all the time then they're trying to say is that you can just do checkpoints on those one gigs. Um, and this is part of the reason why nobody actually does it this way because uh, it's very hard to be able to differentiate you know, what part of the system should be, or what part of the database should be checkpointed all the time versus what, what part doesn't need to be. Typically what everyone does is you take a checkpoint of the entire thing, even if it hasn't been updated since the last time. Because again, this is not something that you know, humans can easily, you know, easily identify to say this is what it should be or not be. It's easy to say a single table could be read only and therefore you don't need to checkpoint it. But to say a segment of the database, a segment of a single table, like half of it needs to be checkpointed, the other half doesn't, doesn't need to be checkpointed, that's a bit more difficult. So again, nobody, nobody actually does this, but we'll still talk about it because I think it's interesting. All right, so naive snapshots is like the, the easiest way to do a checkpoint. And basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna quiesce all the worker threads in the system to prevent them from executing any new transactions. You basically say, hey, stop doing any work. Finish the transactions you have going on, but don't take any new ones yet. And then once when you know all your threads are blocked, then you have the database system take a checkpoint or make a copy of the entire database into some new location in memory. Then you can have another thread write out the contents of that new location in memory out the disk. And then you can allow the other threads to process transactions while this, you're writing this thing out. So again, like I said, it's the most simplest thing you can do. But there's two ways to actually do this. The first is, is sort of you roll your own and do everything yourself, meaning the database system does everything itself, um, where you're going to be responsible in the system for copying blocks of data to a new location and then writing them out. Um, the advantage of this is that you can be ensured that the system is only going to copy just tuples or data, the things that you want to put out in your checkpoint. Remember I said that uh, in-memory databases don't actually record any information about indexes for recovery because you're just going to rebuild the entire indexes when you load the checkpoint back in. So and if you do it yourself, then you only copy just the, just the, 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 the tuples. 
And you may think also too, well, aren't gonna, aren't, I'm going to need the twice amount of memory for my database in order to do this approach. Uh, in actuality, you don't because you can rely on the operating system doing copy and write so that when you actually copy memory, it doesn't actually make a new physical copy. It just has both the, the VM pages point to the same location. And only when you, when you modify the original data, then it does, does the copy. So you could copy your entire database uh, in the naive snapshot and not actually have double the size of, of physical memory. All right, so the first way you can roll your own and again, you, the advantage of this is that you only copy just the tuple data. The other approach is that you can let the operating system do this for you uh, by forking your process, right? And then the downside of this is that the operating system doesn't know that this region of memory corresponds to, uh, to tuples and this region corresponds to indexes, so only copy the tuples, right? It copies the entire address space of, of, of the database process. So this is actually what Hyper does. And I remember reading, or at least in the original version of Hyper, and I remember when I read the paper about this, I was like, oh, that's actually a really clever idea. It's like so simple. You rely on the operating system to do this for you, uh, and it allows you to do some in interesting things. So what they're gonna do is when they wanna take a snapshot, they're gonna fork the database process, and now in your child process, you're gonna have you know, a complete copy of the exact same address space of the parent process. And again, remember I said the operating system is gonna do copy and write, so it's not actually doing a real copy from physical page to physical page. It's just making a virtual memory copy and then only when, the, when either the child or the parent updates the, the, the memory location do you actually copy things around. So what will happen is, in the way uh, Hyper would do this is that they would not actually wait to, to, to pause transactions when they did the fork. They would just do the fork and then on the, the parent process, the, the transactions keep on processing just, you know, just, just as if nothing happened. But in the child process, you would use the in-memory undo log that you're maintaining for your, or your transactions to then abort those transactions and then roll, roll them back. So then when you do that, now you have in your child process a consistent snapshot of the database. And the child process can then write that out to, to, to disk for the checkpoint. So what is interesting about this is like, it's not only does the hyper guys use this for checkpoints, they also actually do this to do analytical queries. So what happened is you have an analytical query come in, rather than running it on the parent process and slowing down your transactions, you can reroute it to the child process and they can do the analytics directly on the consistent snapshot in the child process as it's running out the disk, right? So that's actually kind of clever, it was actually kind of cool. So two things I'll say is that in the newer versions of Hyper, they abandoned this idea and they switched to using multi-version concurrency control. Right, so it's you know, using one of the schemes that we, we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, and I think the reason is because, you know, this is another example where doing a forking is nice and easy, but you, you give up control to the operating system. Whereas if you do multi-versioning yourself, you can, you know, you have more fine control on exactly how memory is being copy, copying and, and you can be more efficient. So the other thing I'll say too is we actually also tried this technique in HDOR a few years ago um, and it turned out to not to work at all. It actually turned out to be terrible. Um, not because the technique didn't work per se, it's because HDOR was actually using Java as like the front end layer for uh, transaction processing and networking and catalogs and things like that. So what happened is if you read the documentation about Java or the JVM, it says do not fork your process, right? Do never fork the JVM. We ignored that, we did it anyway. Uh, and it turns out to be a bad idea because what happens is in the child process, it doesn't restart all the same threads you had in the parent process. So in, like the, in, a, in like a managed memory environment like the JVM, there's a garbage collector thread, there's other system threads running in the background, and those don't get respawned in the child process. And then what happens in the parent process, remember I said again, it's, it's doing copy on write in the operating system. So when the, the JVM's garbage collector starts going through and cleaning up the heap, that starts reorganizing and compacting memory, which then causes an excessive amount of copying to be done and for, the, for the child process. So things get really slow. So it, it worked, but it was really flaky and cumbersome and brittle, uh, and you didn't get the same kind of speed up that the hyper guys did. So the bottom line is don't fork your JVM. Right? Again, re, the documentation says not to do this. We ignored it. Okay. So now sort of related to what I, you know, I talked about MVCC, I talked about making the, these, these these forked snapshots. This is very similar to the second approach to take checkpoints where you can do basically copy and update snapshots. And again, you can think of this as like, um, 
Think of this like as in multi-version concurrent control. It's basically the same thing. That instead of uh, having transactions overwrite tuples as they modify them, when we know we're in the middle of a checkpoint, we require all transactions to make new copies of data, uh, and we have to update our indexes to know, uh, know about them. So what happens is as the checkpoint thread reads or scans the table heap, if it come across a, a tuple or version that was created after the checkpoint started, then it knows it, it can ignore it. Right? And then once the checkpoint finishes, you go back and, and prune things. So what I'm describing here is basically just MVCC. But you're now doing this in the context of, of for, for a checkpoint. So you can use this protocol for a system that doesn't use MVCC to get the same kind of, kind of semantics. And so this is essentially what VoltDB does. So again, VoltDB has that single-threaded execution engines that are doing in-place updates. And they can do this without any locks and latches because they know no other transaction could be touching data at the same time as, as the one transaction is running, right? Because again, it's, it's single-threaded. But when you take a checkpoint, you don't want the checkpoint thread to be running on the same thread you use to process transactions. So they have a separate background thread come along and can scan, scan the table heaps. But now because we, we don't have any locks and latches to protect the, the checkpoint thread from the transaction thread, uh, they switch into this special copy on, copy on write mode where the system essentially becomes, you know, it's not multi-version as you can have multiple versions, it's really a two-version system. So you have the version of the tuple that existed before the checkpoint and the version of the tuple that existed after the checkpoint. And if any thread needs to update, uh, update the same tuple multiple times during a checkpoint, you don't keep creating new versions, you just keep overriding the, 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 the second one. And then when the, the, the ch checkpoint thread finishes, you have a, a complete snapshot on disk, and then you go back and clean up all, all the old versions, basically doing, doing garbage collection. So again, I hope you kind of see that the same ideas for MVCC and the same ideas for all the stuff for concurrent control and things that we talked about before, we can reapply them in the context of, of doing checkpoints. All right, so for the two observations we can make about what we talked about so far is that in the case of, for the naive snapshots, the database system has to pause all the transaction threads uh, in order when we take the checkpoint because we don't want to see any, any dirty data because we want consistent snapshots. So that's bad. And then in the case of doing a copy and update, we have to do uh, additional memory copies um, each time, and that may require us to have to acquire latches, depending on what kind of protocol we're using, uh, in the checkpoint thread, and that may block other, other transaction threads. So based on these two points, this is what the, the sort of the weight-free protocols that you guys read about are trying to, trying to overcome. So the key thing to point out, though, is that I'm saying that they're, they're weight-free, not lock-free or latch-free. So weight-free would mean that the worker threads don't have to wait for the checkpoint thread to finish uh, or start or even finish when it, whenever they want to update the database. Right? They just keep, they can always proceed without any problems. And the way they're going to do this is by maintaining multiple copies of the database, essentially the entire database. And again, they talk about this in the paper as being the application state. I can't see how this could be anything other than the, than the, you know, the, um, than the, 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 the entire database. Maybe you can use a hybrid storage model and say the row store is the thing you checkpoint and the column store you leave alone. Um, but they don't really talk about that. But some of the ideas we've talked about before with hybrid schemes might, might apply here. All right, so in wait for zigzag, what we're going to do is we're going to always have two copies of the database and then our transaction can only write to one of those copies at a time during a checkpoint. And then when the checkpoint finishes and we start the next one, then all the writes will go to the other copy. And so to do this, to figure out which one's where we need to go, we're going to maintain two bitmaps that tell us where the transactions to either do a read or write from on a per tuple basis. And again, this is going to avoid having to do multiple copies of, of the tuples, or maintain multiple copies of the tuple, as we saw in the copy and update approach. So these guys are arguing that the additional computational overhead of having to check these bitmaps and figure out where you should be reading and writing is less than the overhead of having to do copies of individual tuples anytime you update them. So let's walk through an example of the wait free zigzag. So again, we have two copies of the database, right? And we're going to have two bitmaps. In this case here, these bitmaps are going to be correspond to every, every location in the bitmap corresponds to a location in, in, the, uh, in the actual table heap. So in this case here, if we want the second tuple at this position, 
the read bitmap says uh, it's set to zero, so therefore I want to read it from, from copy one. Right? And I know that for, for the second tuple, I can jump here and get, get it. All right, we're not talking about row stores or column stores. Right? For now, just assume that this is some tuple. I'm showing a single value, but it could be multiple values, multiple attributes. And so with the same thing with the write bitmap, the, at this position, if it's set to one, that I, I want to do my write to the second copy. If it's set to zero, I do my write at the, at the first copy. All right, so let's say now that are we, have, we have our system running. This is the, the initial state when we first loaded everything in. So right now, copy one and copy two are exact copies of each other. The read bitmaps are all set to zero, and the write bitmaps are all set to one. So we start doing a checkpoint. And the checkpoint is, thread is going to look at the write bitmap and take the inverse of whatever the values are here, and that's going to tell it where it should go do a read to find a consistent snapshot of the database and that it can write out the disk. So in this case here, when we start, everything's set to one. So if we take the inverse of that and have all zeros, then that tells us that the thing we want to read, our consistent snapshot is, is over here, right? And so now we can have our thread go ahead and write all the contents of this thing in out the disk. So now let's say as we're taking the checkpoint, a transaction comes along and wants to update, update the database. All right? Say our transaction wants to update these three, three tuples here, these positions. So in this case here, it would look in the write bitmap and it would say where it should do its writes. So now that they're set to one, telling us we should do our updates copy on copy two, which is what we want because we don't want it to change copy one because that the checkpoint thread is still trying to write that out. So what happened is we go ahead and apply our updates to copy two. Then we update the read bitmap to flip their bits to say if you now if you're now a transaction that needs to read the latest version for the tuple of this offset, go to get it from copy two. I'm ignoring like uh, what the you know all the high-level uh, coordination going on in the concurrent control scheme, right? All that still applies here. So whether a transaction even, is even allowed to read this depends on the concurrent control protocol, which is independent of everything we're talking about here. So if you have two-phase locking, you still have to go through the, you know, acquire the read locks or to, in order to actually do this read. This is, again, if you're, if, after you acquire those locks, then you can go look up and figure out where it is the thing, where is the thing that, it is that, you, that you need to read from. So now I'll say where checkpoint finishes, right? And let's say immediately, immediately after this, we have another checkpoint thread. So again, the same thing, what, what we need to do is we need to figure out uh, where we, we need to do a read from. But before the checkpoint starts, we need to then map over these values here into our write bit map to say we know that we modified um, the data, we modified the data in, in, in copy two. So therefore, flip that over. So if anybody wants, wants to come out write, it wants to write into copy one. So then the same thing before for our checkpoint thread, we'll take the inverse of all of these and that'll tell us where our consistent snapshot is. And so in this case here, uh, we would see that we want to read uh, for the first tuple in copy two, the second tuple in copy one, and back and forth. Now you see why it's called zigzag because you're sort of zigzagging back and forth between different copies to find the consistent snapshot that you want to you use for your, your checkpoint. And then the same thing, while the checkpoint thread is running, if anybody comes along and updates tuples, right? They would say for this guy here, if it wants to update the first tuple, it'd say go to your right in, in copy one, and this one says go to your right in copy two. And again, our checkpoint thread is not looking, it's not trying to write out these two, these two versions, it's writing out these other versions here. So the checkpoint thread will not see any changes made by transactions after it started. So is, is this clear? All right, so some of the deficiencies in this approach are you have to do this, you know, this, this propagation of changes in the read bitmap into the write bitmap. You want to do that atomically, right? And so there's this, and then you have to you know, reset everything when, every single time you restart the, uh, a, a new checkpoint. So these are some of the deficiencies you have in the, in the wait-free zigzag that they're going to try to overcome in the wait-free ping-pong approach. So in the ping-pong approach, what they're going to do is they're going to trade additional memory and CPU overhead uh, for, for when transactions read and write data and we, when we take the checkpoints in exchange for having to do a longer pause at the end of a checkpoint to reset all those bitmaps. Because right, again, we want, we want to do this atomically to make sure that nobody sees you know, a, partial, a partial snapshot. So what they're going to do is they're going to maintain two copies of the database that we'll call sort of like the, 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 the master copy and the shadow copy.
And then we'll have another uh, copy of the database we'll call the base copy, where, there, there, where it's, it's always being modified uh, for every single checkpoint interval. So what will happen is we'll elect some copy to be the master, and that's when all, all the updates will go into, and then there'll be the base copy that always has those changes. And then when the checkpoint finishes, we'll, we'll do a, a pointer swap to elect the shadow to become the new master, and then write out all the changes that are there while we take the checkpoint on the old shadow. So I'll walk through an example here. All right, again, so we have our base copy here, right, and it has the entire contents of the database. And then we have our two additional copies. And for each of these, we have not only the contents of the database, but also a, a bitmap that says whether this thing was modified in the last checkpoint. And then we have down below, we have our, our master pointer that's going to tell us which of these copies is the master version. So in our current, in our, when we first start up, the, the, the copy one is considered the master. And you'll notice here, in, we have, again, we have all the data we want for, in the base copy. The master copy only has these placeholders to say, here's where new values can go in. And then copy two has the complete snapshot or complete copy of the, of the base data. Because right? this is where we're going to write out our checkpoint from. All right, so again, we have complete copies. That copy is in the base copy and copy two. All right, so now when our checkpoint thread starts, it looks at the shadow copy, which is the copy number two, and it's going to do the same scan through and write that out. And then as transactions come along and do writes, it's going to always apply the writes to the base copy as well as to the master copy. So we apply our changes here right, in both locations, and then we flip the bit to say that this thing is now dirty since the last checkpoint started. We flip, flip it to one. So now, again, when anybody wants to do a read, you can always read the base copy because this will always be consistent. And again, the, the concurrent control scheme above all this is making sure that whatever isolation level we're running at, transactions are, are, are seeing the data they should be allowed to see. All right, so now let's say the checkpoint finishes and we flush that out. So now we want to start a new checkpoint. So we're adding a, the next phase, the next checkpoint interval. So what's going to happen here is that we're going to reset the, the bitmap in the old shadow copy to be all, all zeros, because we want them to be zero, because that means that, that the data is clean. And then in, in my example here, I'm showing that you're also resetting all the, old, the values. You don't technically have to do this, because you're just going to overwrite them with the new values as transactions update them. But for simplicity, I'm showing that, that they get zeroed out. So then now we then switch the master pointer now to be, uh, to be copy number two. And then copy number one becomes the, the master, or sorry, the shadow. So our checkpoint thread can come along now and write out the contents of this. Well, what's one, what's one problem here? Right. So she said the changes that, that were... The, we only have the changes from since the last checkpoint. We don't have the original values because remember they were zeroed out when we started. So what we then need to be able to do is we need to figure out how we actually fill in these contents. Remember I said that we don't want to... Uh, we could just take a delta checkpoint meaning we could just write the things that actually changed since the last checkpoint, but then that would make it difficult to do a recovery because then you've got to replay, go back and look, examine all the other checkpoints to, to fill in the, 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 the missing tuples. So there's two ways you could do this. One way is you could just copy from the base, the base copy the missing values you have into copy number one. Right? Why would this be a bad idea? Because some of these tuples might be updated. Right, he said some of these tuples might be updated. Right, which, you know, the way you would do this, you would go check the, the bitmap here and say, has this thing been modified, yes or no? Like if it's zero, meaning no. If not, then you know you can just go, you know, it's safe for you to go ahead and, and propagate this value in. But now you have a race condition because you could check this bit, you would see that it's zero, and then by the time you go to do the read, someone else has swooped in and modified it, so now you're copying dirty data and you wouldn't know this. Right? Because the only way to prevent that is you would have to take a latch on this guy and then, and then go ahead and do that, which is not, you know, which, which is not what we want to do. So the alternative they propose is what you're actually going to do is the checkpoint thread is going to recognize that it's missing this data and it knows it has to be in the last checkpoint that it took. So it's, it's going to go back on disk, read the last checkpoint, and then fill in its missing gaps and then write them back out. So this is totally different than everything we talked about before for doing checkpoints. All, right, all the other checkpoints were like these threads, write out the data, you know, take whatever's in memory and just write it out the disk and never go back to read it unless you actually have to recover from it. But now what I'm saying is for the, in order for this approach to work, you actually have to go back and read the checkpoint 
fill in your gaps, and then, and then write them back out. Yes? Um, I'm confused about, like, the copy two is, is still over there, right? I mean, when you, when you flip the bits, the bit maps to zero, the, you, you don't have to wipe out the data. I mean, you can just take the data from copy two. So his, so his statement is, uh, when, when I was back here, you have to flip all the bitmaps. So his statement is, couldn't I just copy from copy two into copy one? The answer is no, because you're gonna have the same problem as, as the base copy. So I flip all my bits to zero, and yes, I'm showing that it gets zeroed out, but I'm saying you don't actually have to do that. Right? For, for, for illustration purposes, I'm showing that. But then this, we have the same problem here, is that someone may come and modify this record here, this, this tuple here, uh, in between the time we read that it's zero and then read the value. I'm showing a single value here, but it could be multiple values because it could be the entire tuple. So you can't guarantee that's going to be done atomically. The only way to prevent that is to take a latch. But now you're blocking, you're blocking your, your writing threads. That's a good question. Anybody else? Okay. So, I don't want to talk about the, sort of the, the performance implications of these things, but I, I want to talk about at a high level, the, the primitives they're using, or they talk about how to build up a, a checkpoint protocol. Because I think, again, it's illustrative to understand what these different approaches do at, at, at the lowest level. So what they basically say is that there's f four key constructs you can apply to build a checkpoint protocol. The first is that you can do the bulk state copying, where you basically take, again, the, the naive snapshot approach, where you just copy the entire time of memory, put it to a location, and then write that out. But in order to do this, you have to pause transactions. You could use locks and latches to, to isolate the checkpoint thread from other transactions to prevent them from modifying regions of memory that you're, and you're, as you're actively trying to write it, writing it out. And then the, the, the last two is that you can use this bulk bitmap reset protocol to basically allow you to track the dirty regions and then somehow, wait, and somehow like do a complete modification or flip the bits and now say that they're clean and, and or you've successfully written everything out to know where you, where, you know, what you need to read or not read when you take a checkpoint. And the last one would be just you, you just use more memory uh, to use additional copies for the data that you know will be consistent that you can then safely write out. And you can do this without having to block other threads. So what I really like is this table they show here in the paper where again they have, they break down again the four constructs you have for your checkpoint protocols and then the four implementations of checkpoints and they talk about how they do, do all these things. And again what you see is in the case of the wait for your ping pong, you pay a large memory overhead to avoid having to do uh, locks and latches. Like you have to have three copies of the database at any time. And as I said, as far as I know, no system actually does these two. I would say that this is the most common one uh, for in-memory databases. This is essentially what BoltDB does, MemSQL does this, Times10 does this. This is what pretty much everyone does. Right? And you can do this regardless of whether you're using logical logging or physical logging. This, 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 this implementation just works. Okay? Okay. So, for this class and last class, We've been mostly describing how to do logging and recovery and checkpoints when, when there's a database crash, right? Someone trips over the power cord, the data center catches on fire or whatever, right? And your machine goes down in an unexpected way or an un unexpected interruption. And then you need to load this, turn the system back on and recover, recover the database state. Um, not all database system restarts, though, are going to be from, from these sort of cataclysmic accidents or crashes. Right, there's we all other reasons that are requires to require us to restart our system. Right, so one could be because we, we have to update our operating system or our kernel to make sure we get th the latest security patches, and therefore we have to restart restart the box. Uh, it could be because we want to upgrade the hardware, maybe change instance type on, on EC2, put in more RAM, change change an SSD, or it could be because we actually just want to update our database system software itself. Right? We have a new version of the system, it has better features, it's faster. So we want to stop our, stop our database system, load in the new version, and turn it back on. So what I'll say is that for all these, except for this last one here, all these require you to restart the, 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 the system. Right? Restart the operating system, turn it off, turn it back on. But updating the, the database system, just the software itself, doesn't require you to restart the operating system. 
So, but the problem is because we, we're, we're assuming we have an in-memory database where the primary storage location of the database is in memory, we have to shut the process down. That kills our address space. We lose everything we have in memory. And then we turn the system back on and it goes through the same protocol to recover the database from a checkpoint and the log just as it would if it was, if it was a hard crash or a restart. Right? And that, that could be bad. That could be really slow if your database is really big. Even if you're just really fast, it's going to take a while to suck everything into DRAM. So what we want is we want a way to quickly restart our database system without having to reread the entire database from disk and put it back into memory. Right? And again, we're, we're assuming that we're doing like an upgrade or something. So this is what uh, the Facebook guys uh, were facing in their system called Scuba that they wanted to overcome uh, and they came up with a way to do fast restarts using shared memory. So what this essentially is going to allow us to do is we can, we're going to decouple the in-memory contents of our database in the private address space for our process from the actual process lifetime. So even though the database and process may, may finish uh, and we come back with a new one, with a new, with a new PID, we can then reuse the contents of the old process to avoid having to reload everything back in memory. And I'll, I'll show why they want to do this in Scuba in a second. So again, because we're going to use shared memory to do this, we can restart the process multiple times and the memory contents will always survive. So Scuba is an interesting system at Facebook. It's, it's a distributed system, so we're not really going to talk about the, how they actually implement the distributed or orchestration, the coordination of, of query execution. Um, but it's an interesting system because they built it to do time series analysis for all their uh, log events. So anytime you click anything on Facebook, anytime on the website or on, on, the, on the mobile application, uh, they do sampling for, 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 for those events. Like if you load the page, occasionally they will trace all the steps that your request goes through in their, in their architecture stack and write out a log event to say how much time I spent in the database, how much time did I spend in the, the web server, how much time did I spend in, in the, the caching layer. And they want to throw all this data into a time series database that they use Scuba for and then do event analysis and anomaly detection to, to find out whether there are any you know, unexpected slowdowns in, in their application stack. And they do this because Facebook has this sort of engineering philosophy that they like to push out updates very often. So like, I think every two or three weeks, they're always pushing out a new version of a product, a new version of a system, a new, a new version of a service. So that means that things are going to break, right? You can test it all you want, but it's not really to go into production. Maybe you'll see that the problems occur. So what they want to use Scuba for is they want to log all these different events that occur, and then if they notice that all of a sudden with the new version of an application, the latency of doing requests uh, you know, increases by 3x, then go back and figure out you know, where in the stack you're having a problem. So I'll talk a little bit real quickly about how the, the system is actually architected. It's not entirely relevant to how they do restarts, but I just want to sh show you what it sort of looks like. So they had this sort of tree hierarchy model where you have a bunch of different nodes and at the upper layers of the tree you have what are called aggregator nodes. So these are like stateless machines where they don't actually have copies of the database. They just know how to take information sent from, from the leaf nodes where the database is actually stored and combine them together. You can sort of think of this as a map reduce model or uh, doing group by and aggregation. Right? You take these, the leaf nodes is where the data is actually stored. You do all your scans based on the query. You shove them up to the aggregator and they combine them from the different nodes and, yeah, and you can have multiple levels of this. Right, this is really nice because it's really easy for them to add up new aggregators because they don't actually store any, any part of the database. Right? You just spin a new one up and it sort of fits in with everyone else. Then the bottom is the leaf nodes. What you have is the database actually stored in memory, but then there'll also be a log written out the disk for all the new events that, that occur. So this is the problem that they're trying to solve is that they want to put out, push out new versions of the leaf node software without having to do a complete restart. So the, the paper talks about how you know, even with a fast disk, if you have a 120 20 gigabyte database that you need to load in after the leaf node process restarts, that could take two or three hours. Right? And if your database is even bigger, it's going to take even longer. So now if you have you know, hundreds of machines that you all need to refresh, you know, a large portion of them could, 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 could be down every single time you push out a new version. So what they're going to do in their fast restarts is that they're going to write the contents of the database in shared memory and then mark, you know, the, where the, it's, mark some location of where that shared memory is located out on disk, restart the process, come back up and look at that log entry, figure out where it is in shared memory and then suck that into the new process. So there's two ways to do this. 
The first is that you can just always use shared memory for all your allocations for the process. Uh, meaning you don't, you know, you're, you're, when, you, when you call malloc, you get shared memory rather than private memory or heap memory. Um, and what's really interesting is that Facebook actually spent a lot of time thinking about actually doing this approach. Essentially what you do is you have to re re rewrite a new version of malloc so that when you call malloc it goes to shared memory rather, rather than the heap. And they actually have the guy that invented JE malloc on their payroll at, at Facebook and they spent a lot of time talking with him to decide whether this is the right idea. And they determined that doing this was, was bad because uh, not only you have to write a custom allocator, but there's a bunch of extra stuff you have to do when you, when you subdivide shared memory to make sure that the different threads don't trip up on each other, right? The other big problem too is that in shared memory, you can't have lazy allocation of, of the actual physical pages. So when you say, when, when, you, when you allocate shared memory, uh, the operating system has to guarantee that, that there is actually physical memory backing it. And you can't do that, and you don't want to do that for, you know, for doing copies and things like that because you want to do this in a lazy way. That's the, that's the way to get better performance. So they determined that you didn't want to do this. And what they decided to do instead <coughs> was that, excuse me, when, when, they, the, when the database system is going to go down, <coughs> and again, they're, they're doing this in, it's an, you know, it's, a, it's an upgrade. So it's not like the power got pulled. They know they're going to shut down the system, so they can send a shutdown command to the database system and say, hey, get ready to, to, to restart. And when that occurs, then they start writing out the contents of local memory into shared memory, and then restart the process to come back and suck it all back in. Right? So again, when the database system administrator says, I want to restart this node, they send, send the shutdown command, then it, the database system is going to block all new updates uh, for new events in, in the system. You can still do reads on it, but you're not going to do any writes. And then what happens is, the data system will start copying blocks of memory out to shared memory, and then they can delete the blocks in local memory once they know you're in your, they're in shared memory. And then you update whatever pointers you have to still, you know, you can still read it because you know where it is in, in, in shared memory. Then when the database system snapshot finishes, the data system restarts, comes back with the new, the new code, the new version, figures out whether there is a valid version of, sh of shared memory, uh, the database in shared memory, that it can then copy it into to, to its heap, if not, then it just does the normal uh, the recovery process by reading the checkpoint and the log. So there's a bunch of different uh, safety checks they have in this approach of when they go to check to see whether they can use what's in shared memory um, on a restart. Because what you don't want to happen is if, if the, data, the new version of the database system modifies the layout of data in memory, you don't want to suck that in. You, know, you don't want to have the old version of, of, of the heap try to be used in the new version of the system because then you know, all the pointers and all the alignments will be messed up. So they have someone to check to say, uh, you know, they know that you know, when I took the checkpoint in shared memory, it was at this version of, of the system. And if it's valid, then, then you can reuse it. So like I said, this is actually you know, sort of like the, the hyper guys when they were forking the, um, the process to do checkpoints, the, the, the naive snapshots. This is sort of building off a sort of simple OS primitive uh, to do something interesting. You wouldn't normally do this, on the, you know, as I showed, as I said, you wouldn't want to use shared memory for your regular, you know, your, your regular heaps when you're actually running the real system, but for the special case when you actually want to do a shutdown and a restart, uh, the operating system actually provides you something that, that, that is very helpful here. Which is again, I, think, I think this is really simple and really clever. Alright, so what are my parting thoughts? Uh, I would say I think the copy and update approach for checkpoints is the most common way to go. Um, and it's especially easy if you're using multi-version concurrency control because you get snapshot isolation for free. Uh, you're making new copies anyway because you have to make new versions. So all you need to do is just you know, find the consistent snapshot and write that out to disk. And, th and like I said, this is what pretty much everyone does uh, today. And I also show that in the case of, of the Facebook restart approach, shared memory actually has some, some useful, usefulness at all, a a after all. Um, we, when we started building Peloton, we were still based on Postgres, and Postgres is a multi-process shared memory architecture, and we found that using shared memory f uh, for in-memory database was just too slow and it, it, if you want to add multiple threads, so we end up getting, getting, rid of that, get, getting rid of that entirely. So the older systems will still use your shared memory for the primary, primary storage, but newer in-memory systems don't, don't use that at all. They use private heaps. Okay. All right, so uh, next Thursday, we'll begin the two-part lectures on optimizers.
Um, and this is sort of something, actively, something we're actively working on now inside of Peloton. So we'll talk about the sort of early optimizers on Thursday, and then Tuesday next week we'll talk about sort of the, the modern variants of them. By modern, I mean like the 1990s, but still that's still considered the state of the art right now. And then again, reminder, project number two will be due Thursday next week, still at, at midnight, and then the project three proposals will still be due on the 21st. Any questions?